Um, we're going to continue in Ephesians, and we're going to be in chapter 3 tonight, and start, start our look in chapter 3, and this will be uh, where we'll begin to show the parallel between Ephesians and Colossians in, 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 in these verses tonight. So in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1, it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his apostles, holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, from which from the beginning of the world has been hidden in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And we'll stop there. Um, I want to consider just the phrase, and I recognize the phrase that I want to talk about, probably that's the only thing we will talk about tonight, is the dispensation of the grace of God. And Paul says, the dispensation of the grace of God that was given to him, to you, or to the, to the Gentiles, and pretty to the whole church, but I want us to consider that, and I recognize, and if you search it out in the in the languages and in commentaries and all and they'll verify it but I recognize that Paul is speaking here of a stewardship because that's one of the ways you can translate the word dispensation it's a stewardship that God had entrusted to him to preach this grace of God the unsearchable riches of Christ as he says but I think, and I know, based on the other usage of the word dispensation in this letter that he's also speaking concerning something grander than just God's given me a ministry and a stewardship to minister the grace of God. I think we have to understand the nature of what is involved in his stewardship as a minister of the gospel of grace. Paul will say it's by revelation that he was sent. He says the same thing in Galatians. That he he had the revelation of Christ in him. He'll say that he went to Jerusalem by revelation. And according, and, and what that means is not God, God appeared to him in a dream and said, go to Jerusalem. That's not the revelation he's talking about. He went to Jerusalem in the light of and in accordance with the revelation of Christ that he had received. And that's why he could say, I was not taught this gospel of men, but of God. And so Paul was sent to declare the truth and the reality of the dispensation or the administration of the grace of God. So you can see he's not just saying I have a stewardship to preach the grace of God. He is saying my stewardship is to declare to his body those who are not just Jew and Gentile, but those who would come into the body, partakers of the promise of God in Christ. I am given to declare the dispensation of the grace of God to the church. And I think we have to realize that this is the stewardship that we all have as ministers of the new covenant. That's what we're called. <coughs> ministers, administrators, or those who administer the good news. And as we stated in another lesson uh, when we were dealing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 this is this is the wisdom this is the wisdom of God this is that hidden wisdom because he calls it even here the mystery that was hidden 
this is that wisdom that we preach among those who are complete or perfect. There is nothing for us to hold back. There is not another missing thing or um, a dangling participle out here in the future that God's still waiting to disclose to us in the preaching of the dispensation of the grace of God. And that's what we're going to look at. Paul is showing the church, the body, that what they have come to by the grace of God through faith is a dispensation that fulfills and perfects what the previous dispensation could merely point to and could not bring to perfection. He is declaring the end of God's purpose, the end of God's will, the end and the completion of God's predetermination as we read about in the first chapter of Ephesians, that which is preordained and predetermined by God. That's what he's declaring to the church. And so if we want to look in Colossians now in chapter 1, we're going to see the parallel verses, that, just in some different words, but in some same words, but he says the same thing here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, we'll start there. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, and this would take in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Ephesians, so it kind of encapsulates all three of these uh, chapters in just that statement. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, this should bring your mind to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And you that were sometime alienated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and without blame, are unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, or to preach fully the word of God. Even the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, who is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus, whereunto I labor, striving, according to his working, which works mightily in me. And you can see the parallels, the beautiful parallels of Ephesians and Colossians in this. And it's, it's a beautiful realization that what he's saying in Ephesians when he's talking about the unsearchable riches of Christ, the fellowship of the mystery, because what he says in Colossians, it can, it can be missed that the only means of the fellowship that was hidden in the ages before, which is the testimonial ages of the Old Covenant, the whole means of this great fellowship the Jew and the Gentiles being partakers of the same body, fellow heirs together, partakers together of the promises and the inheritance. It all hinges upon this very same thing. Christ in you. And that's how you see that both of these things, although parallel, one kind of gives a further explanation of the other. And when he's speaking of those who are partakers of the inheritance, 
those who are his body. This dispensation of God, as he says, or this dispensation of grace, those who are found in a greater dispensation that does not prophesy and promise something, but provides what the first dispensation promised, gives to the soul in its fullness, in its completion, what the first dispensation pointed to in testimonies, types, and shadows. And all of this is made possible. And this is what God would make known. This is what God has revealed, he says in Colossians, to, to his saints. And has made manifest to his saints. And that is the glory of this mystery is Christ in you. The hope of glory, which is the thing hoped for. Remember what he says uh, earlier in Colossians chapter 1. If you be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That is not to say that the gospel we preach, remember, this all, uh, it all, te- uh, what's the word, confirms itself. The scripture confirms scripture. Paul wrote the same thing here. And when you're seeing the hope of the gospel, Paul is not saying the gospel gives you a hope for something more. The hope of the gospel is this right here. The gospel itself declares the hope fulfilled is Christ in you. Even if you look at it in the Greek language and just look at the word. In the Greek language, uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The word hope there in the context of these verses is is not something yet to be hoped for. It's the very thing that was. It is the object of hope, not hope as a thing looking into the future for fulfillment. It is the object that was hoped for. Christ in you is the object that was always hoped for. He was the predetermined end and goal that God always had in mind. And throughout the dispensation of testimony, uh, the ages as he says here, the generations and the ages of mystery where he would use types and figures and priesthoods and and nations and kingdoms to testify of a reality that he has now fulfilled in its spiritual consummation in Christ, in his body, in his church, that that gospel declares the dispensation of God fulfilled, the true new dispensation to be embodied perfectly, completely in the person of Christ who dwells in you. Not giving you hope and make you to look and deviate your soul's gaze from the one who's in you. I mean, this is the very letter, Colossians, that will tell you, since you are raised with Christ. I mean, in chapter 2, he says, in him you are perfect, made complete. You are complete in him. And then he would warn them about being swayed by the Judaizers to go go to the law, to look into the shadows of a testimony, to find the substance that they already have in Christ. To try to fill up what they are told is lacking by religious-minded men and law observers. He's saying to them, since you are risen with Christ, since you are in this body, that's what if you read in, you know, if what we talked about in Ephesians, this is the body he's raised up. It's not Jesus raised alone. It is him bringing forth much fruit. It's, it's a church that is bound to him over which he is the head, and that head fills his body fully with his own life and his own substance. And since you are raised with Christ, he would say, don't look to those things that, that profit nothing at all. But set your affection on that which is above so that you can see. And he will appear as the reality that makes you complete already. As the reality that is bestowed to you this grace, this full mystery made known, this glory that was always hoped for. Now set your heart to see the one who has wrought such a work in you that you may know as you are known that your soul may become cognizant of the presence of God's own Sabbath. I think that's beautiful, the way these things answer themselves. 
and how again when we read Ephesians when we talk about the dispensation of the grace of God it should immediately draw our mind back to chapter 1 right and he uses the same word again it is in chapter 10 but we're going to start in verse 6 of Ephesians 1 and just reread these chapter 1 of Ephesians verse 6 to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace wherein he has abounded toward us in his wisdom and prudence having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him so Paul is describing this dispensation that he is proclaiming as well not that he has a stewardship to declare this dispensation that's brought all the times that led up to this moment all the times and seasons holy days of the old covenant of the law of the prophets those days shall come you know those times shall come the prophets would say when all of those times when the fullness when the fulfilling of those times came now we have a brand new dispensation now we have a brand new age a new covenant a new creation and Paul describes it as blessed with all spiritual blessing these are the realities of the dispensation of the grace of God not the dispensation of the law but the dispensation of grace our being accepted in the beloved receiving in him forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace that are now abounding toward us as the fullness of his wisdom making known the mystery of his will his predetermined purpose and how does that look him gathering all things in heaven and earth into one man even in Christ and as we stated in the previous lesson, heaven and earth spoke of, or speaks of, the Jew and the Gentile. That they are reconciled by his death and raised as one body in Christ. A body wherein there is neither Jew or Gentile. What a mystery that is. But see, that's the work of reconciliation. That's the work of the dispensation of grace. Because God has not just changed some external deeds of men that just want to change their ways. He comes inwardly and changes the very heart and changes the internal makeup of the soul and makes it no longer Jew, no longer Gentile, but known of God by the person and presence of Jesus Christ. He ushers into the soul a righteousness that does not belong to a Jew so that a Jew can boast. A righteousness that doesn't belong to a Gentile so that a Gentile can boast. He brings something into the soul of both Jew and Gentile that has nothing to do with circumcision or uncircumcision. This is the dispensation that Paul is declaring to those who are in Christ that leaves no room for the boasting of men and the lauding of their efforts and zeal but only boasting in Christ that's what this dispensation has brought it is where all thing old things are passed away behold all things are are new the new has come and and Paul would say in those verses and all things are of God that's the dispensation of the fullness that God has wrought and brought in and that's the dispensation Paul is preaching and in that dispensation, in that age or administration of the Spirit of God, there is no distinction as there was in the first. And we, we talked about why there was a distinction, why the division of the law was there, as a testimony of two different covenants, of two different men. So in this dispensation, towards which every previous age leaned, and everything of it progressed unto the dispensation of God himself, there is described a realm in which we are blessed with every 
thing, every blessing in its spiritual form, and are accepted in the beloved. In fact, when you look at the word accepted, you'll see the word grace. It's just the word grace. The dispensation of grace is that we have been graced in the beloved. We always worried about the blessings. The blessing is the grace of God that has come unto you. And we're going to see pictures of that in, in just a little bit. So notice the nature of this administration of fullness. That he has gathered all, heaven and earth, Jew and Gentile, into one body. And we have to keep in mind the grandeur of this that God has bestowed to those who have believed in him. Because he can say this in, in verse 7. Again, I'm chapter 1 of Ephesians. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to his grace. Wherein he's abounded. Listen to his words. Abounded toward us in all wisdom. We're talking about God's wisdom. In the fullness of his wisdom he has abounded unto us. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself. Or predetermined in himself. And this is significant. Because we're seeing that in the resurrection of Christ. In the body that is raised. In the church that is built, I'm using just phrases that's used about this same thing. In a new creation that is created in Christ, through that full exercising of his divine power toward us, or to usward as it says in chapter 1 of Ephesians, a creation, a body comes forth that is filled with the fullness of the risen and glorified Son, and he exercises his dominion over that body as the head of that body as the one in whom that body is fully known and fully identified the Adam Clark commentary speaks of the fullness of time here or the dispensation of the fullness of time as the dispensation in which is the consummation of every preceding dispensation And I will say today, and, and tell you now, there's only been two dispensations. The first was the testimony, and the second is Christ himself living in his church. That's the, that's the two. It is that which was a testimony of reality, and then the very bestowal and person of that reality given to the soul. In fact, the New Century version of Ephesians chapter 1 says this, His goal... Because when we read in the dispensation of the fullness of time, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, it actually says looking or with a view toward the dispensation of the fullness of time. All of this was a looking toward. And that looking toward has been fulfilled in Christ himself. In that which he has done, that which he has wrought, his finished work. That he exercises and administers as the administration of the grace of God in his body, in his church. But it says in the New Century Version, his goal was to carry out his eternal plan when the right time came that all things in heaven and on earth would be joined together in Christ as the head. That is Colossians 1 saying that in all things he would have preeminence. That he would be the head through which it all is known. That he would hold it all together. This is all Colossians 1. All things are held together by him. In him all things consist. And we think about Mars and Venus. And if, he, if, he's, you know, if they slip out of his fingers, they'll fall out of the sky. That's not what he's referring to. He's speaking of the all things of a new creation that God testified of in the first creation. This reality consists and is held together in this man in whom all fullness, it pleased God all fullness should dwell. And because we are the body of that one and he is the head of that body of his fullness we have received and we are complete in him. This is the this is the gospel of the dispensation of the grace of God. 
And again, it's unfortunate how we diminish the great significance of the creation of the church and the body, that new man, and he's the head of it. We think of the church and we just imagine, you know, a gathering of just a bunch of pathetic individuals who have very little to offer anybody. And that's true. We are weak. We're fragile. But see, that's what makes his body wonderful. That what, that's what makes this work of God significant because that body is known and identified and filled with the fullness of him and not us. We are not the ones who make that body great or make that body real or perfect or any of it. The life that fills that body determines the state and condition of that body. The body that is raised is the full intention of God made manifest. And we'll see that in, in other lessons where he goes on in this chapter. It is that body that exists due to this carrying out of his will and his intention that will make manifest his will through all the ages to the principalities and the powers he'll go on to say that's the church that's the body that's why it's so significant to understand that the church is not just a bunch of earthen vessels getting together in a room. The church is defined by the treasure, the riches of the grace of God that lives in those weak and fragile vessels. That's the significance of a new creation. That's why it's the dispensation of grace and mercy and the kindness and love of God that Paul will present all of those things throughout this letter. The dispensation of grace, again, let me just say this for all those who might have a dispensational thought and mindset who might listen. The dispensation of grace is not just another dispensation along the lines of numerous successive dispensations that have been and will be. God didn't, you know, have his plan you know, a linear plan, a linear, linear timeline based upon this dispensation and this dispensation. You know, we have the dispensation of innocence and the dispensation of uh, the law, and then we have the dispensation of this and the dispensation of the church and the dispensation of... That's not how this works. There's two, and we're going to see that. We're going to read that in a moment. There's two dispensations or two administrations of God. The one wherein he utilized earthly elements to testify of a spiritual reality and the other is the very spiritual reality itself remember the law was a shadow of the thing that was coming the thing that has come the person of the new covenant is the fulfillment or the very substance that cast that shadow in the first place there was a he's coming and now there's he is here if we want to simplify it that's what we're talking about Two, two ages, two dispensations. So, when you look at the word itself, it means an administration, a stewardship, an economy. It is, it deals with the manner in which a household is stewarded or overseen. It deals with the administrating of a household or how the riches and the wealth and the inheritance of that estate is actually administered. Therefore, Paul is persistent in reminding us how such riches of the grace of God, such riches of God's love and kindness toward us have been administered. It hasn't been administered to the Jew only, or it hasn't been administered to the Gentile only, or to the Gentile now and later to the Jew. That's not how it works. This had been administered once and for all to those who have come to him, those who are found in him, born of his spirit, all fullness. That's the beauty of it. He doesn't give me a portion and you a portion. Every one of us has the fullness of him. Why? Because he is inexhaustible. Of his fullness we have all received. 
I've heard often, you know, I have a piece of Jesus and we come together and we both, you know, have our pieces of Jesus. No, we all have the same thing. And the same thing we have is fullness. We all have him in his fullness. And in that, God has administered such riches to our soul by his grace as a gift. So that our souls filled with the fullness of another, not ourselves, fullness of another man, could boast alone in the sufficiency of that man. That we would hold, as, as Colossians will go on to say about those who are not holding to the head, but looking to the other things to try to supplement by religious exercises what they think is lacking in their salvation. He said, the issue is you're not holding to the head from which the whole thing is supplied and nourished and, and sustained. This is, this is the truth of our salvation, that Christ is all and that there is nothing else. That when we received him, we received the fullness that God always had in mind. All that he had intended and predetermined is in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you have come to all that God intended. And if Christ is in you, all that God intended is in you right now. The question is not the missing or the lacking. The question is, do we understand or have we seen and comprehended the reality that God has bestowed to us in all of its fullness? That's a soul that is replete with everything that is of the divine nature. And in that divine nature, we have been given all things pertaining unto life and godliness. That is not so that we can live godly. It's so that in the bestowal of the nature that is not of us but is divine, the word divine should imply it's not about us. In the bestowal of a nature that is this perfect and this divine, in that giving of that nature is bestowed to us everything of the life that he is and everything of the godliness, holiness, perfection, sancti sanctity, and sacredness of his life. That's why it can be said of us in the verses we've read that we should be holy and without blame unreprovable in his sight. Why? Because we're not the ones who stand in his sight acceptable. We stand in the one who is accepted. We live in the one that pleases his heart and satisfies his demand and his will. So when we are brought into the church by new birth when we are brought into the body of Christ we've come to it all we've come to the kingdom of God to the full exercise of his sovereign rule it's unfortunate people are still waiting on that sovereign rule to be exercised in the earth so were the Jews looking for that and he says my kingdom's not of this world and my kingdom cannot be observed by ocular evidence, by seeing it naturally with your natural eyes. It's never going to be that way. The kingdom of God is within you. And the kingdom is defined here. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Problem is, we say those words and we've so brought them into the earth to define them, we don't understand how wonderful those words are because they're defined in him and not us. They're defined in the heavenly reality, not in the earthly familiarity that we bring to them. Because we think righteousness is about how we live. No, righteousness is the life that he is. Righteousness is his nature. That's who he is. That's why he is made unto us righteousness. So, in this dispensation of the grace of God, we have come to the fullness and the unfolding of the completion of everything God divinely arranged in testimonies, and types, and figures. And I'm going to read this to you. This is Vine's expository dictionary. He says it this way. 
uh, he says that the dispensation is the the let's see the completion of the arranged errors and the imparted cycles of truth. That's the he can he's using, you know the times in which God spoke to, through the prophets unto the fathers in diverse ways, the imparted cycles of truth, which are now consummated in the truth relating to the church as the body of Christ. So understand, we're describing the dispensation of grace that Paul was authorized to declare to his church. And this is what, again, we're going to read these verses. Um... about the, the, the hope of the gospel. Be not turned away from the hope of the gospel. It's the same thing. It's the dispensation of the grace of God that he has given stewardship to preach. What is the hope of the gospel? It is a gospel that declares the hope of God, the hope and intention of God, the very hope of all nations, as it says in the testimony, fulfilled in Christ who is in you. Don't be moved away from that. Abide there. Continue in that sufficiency. Continue in that perfection. Don't let anybody sway you and deviate your heart's attention away from that which has established you in all fullness. Because he'll say, you know, if you're grounded and rooted, and we, we think, okay, I've got to get grounded and I've got to get rooted. And we, we read that in the first and the second chapter. If you're grounded, if you're rooted, and so we read those words in the English translations and we say, okay, how in the world do I get grounded and rooted? And so we have someone tell us, this is how you get rooted in Christ. This is how you get grounded. But in the Greek, the, the word grounded is in the perfect participle, which means laying a perfect foundation. And in the perfect participle, or the perfect tense, it speaks of something that is complete, a complete state, something that has been completed in past times that now has a present and perpetual result. He's saying, this is, you are already grounded. This is already where you stand. This is the foundation upon which God has placed the feet of the believer, something that's never going to move. You are grounded in this hope fulfilled. You are grounded in this that God has wrought. And that's why we, as ministers of the new covenant, must preach the true foundation upon which we all stand. Or else, we'll have believers who hear something less than that, always assuming that there's some kind of a innate fragility or instability regarding their salvation, regarding their fellowship with God or God's fellowship with them. But that is not the case in the dispensation of the grace of God. That's not the case at all. In Him, we stand sure, grounded, firm. The problem is when the soul's reality is not first presented to the believer in which that reality abides as the truth of their salvation. Secondly, they are not seeing the one who makes it so. They are not observing the face of the one who makes all things complete. And they're still trying to find something of that completion in themselves. And then we run on that wheel forever and we go nowhere. Except in self-condemnation most of the time but see in him there is no condemnation why not just because hey i just stopped condemning myself i'll live the way i want i'm a believer the grace of god is sufficient no that's not the grace of god no that's not what that means there's no condemnation because in the the spirit of life himself lives in me freeing my soul from the, from the bondage of sin and death and is in me the fulfilling of the righteous demands of the law. Meaning, I haven't done any of this. 
God did it in me, and all that's left for me to do is to rejoice in it. That's why the kingdom of God is joy, unspeakable, full of glory. And this is not just some transitional statement here, right? So let's look at some verses that tell you about these two dispensations. And I will we'll show you the distinction between the dispensation of the law and the dispensation of the grace of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse, we'll start in verse 6. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Again, this phrase, the letter kills, the Spirit gives life, is not just Paul filling a space and transitioning with just some flippant statement. This is significant. In this phrase, we see the true difference between the two dispensations that are being contrasted in here, in this, uh, in these verses. The one, the law and the commandments, the letter that which was written on stones, kills. It fails to provide the life that the soul of man necessitated. That's why Paul can say, the law, although I saw in it a means of righteousness, by the law, uh, what was it? Uh, the letter killed me. That's Romans 7. It slew me. That's what the letter does. The letter, it doesn't have to kill you. That's just terminology. But it doesn't have to kill you because you're already dead in sin before you come into Christ. What it does is exposes you as already being dead in sin, governed by death and sin. Inwardly, the law of sin and death is in you before you're born again. And that's what the letter does. The letter demands it because it is the righteous demand of God. That's what the law was. But it could not get into the soul to provide what it demanded. So it kills. It exposes the death of man and shows him to be who he really is. We're going to see that in the testimony in a minute. Beautiful. But the Spirit in opposition to that and to fulfill and do what the law could not do that's Romans 8 again what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh the spirit comes because that's the nature of the dispensation of grace it is spirit and therefore it is life and that spirit gives the life of Christ that's why Paul would say in Galatians 3 that if the law written in letters and written on stone could provide life then righteousness would have been by the law but it could not that was not its intention the intent of the previous dispensation was to point to prophesy of and guide men to its end which was Christ himself as a schoolmaster under Christ but when the dispensation of the fullness of those times came and the spiritual dispensation arrived on the scene. Jesus comes and says what? I have come to give life, and that abundantly. And that's a life that did not exist before and could not exist before until life himself arrived. And so the Spirit comes and gives us as a gift the life of the one in whom all fullness dwells. And that life provides the righteousness the law could not provide and that's that's Romans 8 the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us so the letter kills but the spirit gives life now verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 3 and we're going to see the contrast between these two administrations as he uses the word here but it's same word and dispensation we're going to see the difference if the administration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious it did have a glory <coughs> Solomon had a glory he was glorious but Jesus himself says one greater than Solomon stands in your midst so if that administration of death listen to how it's 
designated the administration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance which glory was to be done away how shall not the administration of the spirit be more glorious <coughs> excuse me for if the administration of condemnation be glorious notice that the administration that kept you in a state of death simultaneously condemned. Condemned the one that's in that state. Not so that you can look for a way to better yourself like we do in Christianity, but so that it would turn the heart to look unto the reason that law existed, the one unto whom it pointed and spoke. <coughs> So if the administration of condemnation be glory, much more does the administration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, speaking of the first dispensation, by reason of the glory that excelleth, that's the dispensation of the grace and spirit. For if that which is done away, that's the first dispensation, was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. And that word remains has eternal connotation to it. Not for a season, not for a time. It remains. It abides. Remember when the Spirit descends upon Jesus, what did it say? And it remained upon him. That is this glorious dispensation of grace. It remains. It will not be superseded by another because there's nothing greater that could ever possibly come. <coughs> so, let's go on in these verses. The next section. And we're back in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 3. How by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As afore, I wrote in few words, Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Again, in Colossians, he says the same thing. You know, that was hidden through the ages, but is now made manifest to his saints. But is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And in these words, I read these words, and you can just, you know. And even commentaries that I read kind of use this type of language. But where he says that you would read and understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul was not, you know, attempting to exalt his understanding over these simpletons he's writing to. You know, that wasn't, he wasn't that arrogant. To think that he, I mean, the least of all saints, he calls himself in this in this letter, understanding he's not worthy of such a stewardship. But he was rightly desiring to share with the church the full knowledge that God had made known to him. Not that he fully understood it, but that the full knowledge of God was already made known in him. I may not know the full knowledge of God fully, but in me dwells the full knowledge of God. So I'm not getting more. I'm just comprehending the much more that God has already provided. That's the whole thing. And Paul wanted them to understand that this mystery is no longer something hidden from us. This is no longer kept under the rug. It's no longer hidden behind veils. It's no longer hidden in types and figures and ceremonies and holy days. What we've come to is spiritual in its nature and brings about the fullness of what those things spoke of. That's what we as his body, as his temple, as his church have received. Whether we be naturally born a Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. And he wants them to see that the things that were not disclosed in the previous age was the thing that God has now made manifest to us in his son. 
Paul was preaching to this church to make known the identity and the in, the indwelling realization and consummation of all that was hidden under that first dispensation. For the dispensation of the gospel or the grace, it's, it's called the dispensation of the gospel as well. And you can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17. He calls it the dispensation of the gospel. But that, that dispensation provides what the first hid in ceremonies. Problem is, we still get caught up in ceremony. We still get caught up in rituals. We still get caught up in the touch not, taste not, handle nots that he rebuked the Colossian church about. The problem is we're not even going back to the actual authentic law that God gave. We're just making stuff up as we go. We're just creating out of full, you know, out of mid air what we think God would want. And we're doing it. We're getting busy. We're getting after it. And the thing is what God wants, God has done. What God was always after, he has done it and he's provided it to us in this dispensation of the mercy and grace of God. How? Christ in you. The hope of glory. There it is. That's the end of the matter. So many in the church, so many ministers, and it frustrates and even angers me at times, so many ministers overlook the significance of just that very thing. And in that very thing, there is everything. Christ is in me. We just flippantly say those things. And that's why the new birth has been so disregarded and looked at as a stepping stone for greater things. No, the new birth is when the greatest thing comes. And the mystery of this whole thing was so that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, the partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. That's what he says in verse 6 of Ephesians 3, that the body of Christ would be made up not just of Jews, because they're his special people, but Jews and Gentiles who now come into a reality and have the circumcision of the heart wherein there is neither of those distinctions. Period. But Christ all in all. Christ determining the state, not your nationality or your natural heritage. Not the fact that you had a law, you know, that you observed and these folks didn't. None of that matters anymore. See, that's what the dispensation of the grace of God is ushered in. And we're going to read that here. Um, just one section. And when we read of the mystery being that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. And he says, you know, these things, this is the mystery, this is what was hidden under the testimony all of these ages. You know what that means? That means you'll find the testimony of that throughout the Old Testament. You'll find that spoken about throughout the thing. We, we talked about that in the salvation of Jew and Gentile alike in Esther and Ruth, right? So, Let's read some prophecy concerning this very mystery, this very fellowship of the mystery. In Isaiah chapter 56, start in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Keep you judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. That means there's a salvation coming. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold upon it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, that keeps his hands from doing evil. Can anybody say, that's not me, I can't do that? Right? Neither let the son of the stranger... Because, here's the thing, we can all, I'm, I'm going to show you. We'll look at all this stuff and we'll say, well, I'm disqualified too. But in the midst of these things he's saying, he's saying, do not say this. Do not say that you are uh, unqualified because to be unqualified implies that you ever, you were at one time qualified. 
you've never been qualified. Because of this perfection, no, for this perfection, no man qualifies. That's the whole point. So that's what he's showing here in the coming of this new thing, into this salvation that is coming and this righteousness that is going to be revealed. So verse 3, neither let this, uh, him that can keep the Sabbath from polluting it and keeps his hands from doing evil, verse 3, neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. And neither let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree, a fruitless tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Man, that should point us to all kind of new covenant and New Testament verses. Even unto them will I give in my house, within my walls, his house, his church, his body, a place and a name that is better than than of sons and of daughters. I will give you an everlasting name. Wonder whose name that is. Wonder the name by which the church is named. I will give them an everlasting name that shall never be cut off. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it again we look at that and we say I can't do that I can't not pollute the Sabbath the moment I enter into it it's polluted that's the grace of God that's the grace of God it is not of you but of him see that's let me say it this way salvation itself new birth itself Christ in you ensures that you will not pollute the Sabbath Let that sink in without putting a question mark on it. Salvation itself ensures that you will not pollute his Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath that God provides to you is not something you keep or don't keep. The Sabbath God gives is a rest that keeps you. It keeps you. It holds you. Because it is Christ and not you. And that's what I mean. Salvation ensures that the, salva that the Sabbath cannot be polluted. How do you say that? Multiple ways. Not I but Christ. Of God and not of us. And by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Of God are you in Christ who has made unto you righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's how I can say it. And that's how the scriptures have said it. And that's what the new covenant is. That's what the dispensation of grace provides. A Sabbath unpolluted, a righteousness untainted because it is not of you, it's of him. It's not in your hands to either fumble or hold. It is in his hands that never changes. Those who keep my Sabbath from polluting it takes hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring into my holy mountain, their Zion, and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Thy burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathered the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. And this is the thing. He says, Those who are, those who are strangers... Let them not say the Lord has separated me. Let them, you know, let them not say I am not worthy to be admitted into the privileges of the native Israel. And then he begins to talk about the eunuch. We all know what a eunuch is, right? A castrated fellow. And, un and we're going to read in Deuteronomy 23, it very simply says this. And this is graphic. Forgive me but it's scripture Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 no one whose testicles have been crushed or whose organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord no one born of a forbidden union they call it a bastard in the King James may enter the assembly of the Lord what a ban That's, 
that you're banned. Why? Because you're imperfect. You have a defect. And under the under the law, under this system, eunuchs, strangers, they're not eunuchs were not admitted at all into the congregation of Israel. But look at what he said. This is James Foster Brown commentary. I love this. He says, yet under the gospel administration or the gospel of grace, the eunuch and the stranger are fully released from religious and civil disabilities. You know what that means? Your disability doesn't mean anything here. You're not banned because you have some ailment, disability, and infirmity. Why? Because coming into Christ heals the infirmity. It makes it of him and not of you. There's the healing. By his stripes we were healed. You better believe it. Not I, but Christ. That is your healing. That's your healing. And you can take this. It removes the condemnation of those who are incapable, and it leaves the sufficiency of the one who's provided what they're incapable for. See? Remember Paul saying this in 1 Corinthians? You see your calling, brethren? And he's, in, he's addressing the ambitions of both Jews and Greeks toward God. And he's saying, not wise have been called. Nobody noble has been called. And all of these things, it could cause you to look at yourself and say, I'm separated. I'm a dry, fruitless, barren tree. I have no ability and cannot produce anything as a eunuch. Could not. That's why it was a eunuch. Couldn't produce. The grace of God brings into the soul the wholeness and completion that these infirmed, diseased vessels possess. We are that eunuch. We are that stranger. But he says, come. You now have a place here. I will bring you into my holy mountain. I will bring, that's the grace of God. That's the mercy that looks at us infirmed. What does he say again? Civil disabilities. He looks at our disabilities. He looks at our uh, poorness of spirit, as he says in Matthew 5. And he provides the sufficiency that overrides our insufficiency. And I saw this, and we'll stop. Second Samuel chapter 9. I see the same picture here. And this is when David becomes king and Saul's house is destroyed. And the custom of that day was that the new king would come in and destroy everything of the previous house and the previous family and get, just kill it all. Kill, kill everything. Start over. But here's what David says. 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 8. David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness unto him? Ziba said, Jonathan yet has a son who is lame in his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, and the son of Emilio, in Lodabar. King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. And now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, What is your servant? that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am. See, that's a good answer. 
That's the truth concerning us. Who are we that you should look upon such dead dogs, such frail vessels? Isn't that asked in the Psalms and Hebrews it's answered? What is man that you are mindful of him? So he comes and he shows kindness. He, he dispenses grace to this one who is what? Lame in his feet. He can't do anything. He couldn't be a soldier in the army. He couldn't even be a good, a productive servant in the house. But he brings him in lame. It says twice in this whole thing, he's lame in his feet, lame in both feet. And he ate continually at the house. Why? Because he overlooked the lameness? No, because the lameness didn't matter. When the grace of God comes, when the kindness of the king is extended, the lameness of the one to whom that kindness is extended means nothing because it's overridden, it's overcome, and we eat at his table continually. This is the dispensation of the grace of God that we preach. That's the dispensation we have stewardship to pro pro proclaim to his body. So, we'll stop there. Amen. Amen.